We do have an outline for tonight. Um, if Ben can uh, get you an outline, if you need one and you haven't grabbed one on your way in, go ahead and lift up your hand so he knows to get you one. Uh, the outline it allows you to follow along, see where we're going, and, and it kind of gives you a gauge of how much longer we have in the text. So, um, <laughs> so we're finishing up the Upper Room Discourse, and um, last week, uh, the, the last verse, I want to start with uh, what we just read. I want to start with the end in mind. Um, the last verse, Jesus said in verse 33, you're going to have suffering in this world, but be courageous, I've conquered the world. You're going to have suffering in this world, but be courageous, I've conquered the world. And, and this is the victory that we have in Christ, right? We, we have a God who, who loves us, and he's living, he's alive, he's active, and he's overcome the world. And I, I don't know if you've looked around lately um, at the world, but people, uh, people are suffering, people are hurting. And, and by the way, you're not exempt from that. Right? We, don't, we don't have to look outside of our own household. Suffering and hurt and pain even comes to our own household. And, and Jesus gives us that reality check, and he says, you're, you're not exempt for that. You're going to have suffering. So whoever told us to come to Christ and all of our suffering will be relieved, uh, that, well, they sold you a bill of goods. They lied to you. That's not the promise of Christianity. The promise of Christianity is you will have suffering in this world, but... You could also be courageous. Why? Because he has overcome the world. The sufferings of this world are common to all of us. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer, you will experience suffering. Coming to Christ doesn't make you exempt from that. The only difference is that in Christ, we overcome suffering. And that's the big difference. Um, fun fact, I don't know if it's fun, it's about suffering. Um, I, I looked up the, the global uh, pain management industry. I don't know if you've seen like the documentaries about painkillers and Oxycontin and just people trying to relieve pain and just the epidemic that that's caused with opioids and different pills. And, um, and you know, it can be a racket, but people have suffering that they just need alleviated. And, and in the global pain management industry, it's $81.5 billion just to relieve pain. $81.5 billion every year just for pain management. That doesn't include uh, the, the global therapy and behavioral health uh, industry. So there, there's actually more money spent on that than there is on pain management. Physical pain management is emotional and mental pain management. It's $151.7 billion annually. Uh, and, and by the way, in 10 years, it's, it's expected with the growth rate of people needing mental health services, it's expected to go from $151 billion to $310 billion in 10 years. People are making a living off of trying to ease the suffering and the pain of human beings. Why? Because it's just filled in this world. In, in the U.S. alone, we spend over $162 billion. That's just our own country, $162 billion every year to relieve the physical and emotional pain we experience as a result of living in a fallen world. And, and that's just two industries. That doesn't even include all of the other industries that deal with suffering. That doesn't include uh, the overall health care system. That doesn't include uh, divorce and family law. That doesn't include uh, police departments and, and first responders, fire departments. That doesn't include the money that we spend on uh, relieving poverty or food disparities or housing insecurities or homelessness or violence or drug addiction. It's like the entire human existence is bent towards trying to relieve the pain and the suffering that humanity experiences as a result of living in a fallen world. This is our life. This is what we experience. And Jesus says, in this world, you will suffer. And so, so our, our point, the, the first point in our message tonight as we're looking at this text is you will have suffering and the world can only offer you superficial peace. We have to understand this. Like there, there is suffering in this world in everybody. We're spending trillions of dollars to try to relieve the suffering that we experience as a result of living in a fallen, fallen world. And all of this money can only bring superficial or temporary peace. When we think of peace, a lot of times we think of like a lack of conflict, like I want peace in my life, or some sort of like removal of stress. We want to be freed from stress, or maybe uh, peace is like some delusional state of constant happiness and bliss. Like that doesn't exist, and you're, it's a chasing after the wind if you're trying to, to experience freedom from stress. I, I looked at this, um, there's a popular mindfulness app 
Uh, I'm not going to say the name of it, but, but they wrote an article on how to achieve inner peace, right? So this is the world. And it's like, hey, what is inner peace? Inner peace is a state of tranquility where you feel at ease with yourself, others, and the world around you. It's about being fully present and comfortable in your skin, less impacted from anxiety, worry, and stress. When you experience inner peace, you accept who you are, your strengths, your flaws, your desires, dreams, everything that makes you uniquely you. Well, good luck. Good luck with that. Because all of the, the remedies that the world offers never actually helps you achieve that. They promise that. That's what the goal is. Download this app. Buy these pills. Take this drug. Have whatever you want to fill in the, the, the void that is in your heart. Some of the tips are meditate, live in the present, have a positive mindset, love yourself, care for yourself. Visualization, what does that mean? Think of a happy place. Uh, Breathing, nature, get in nature, practice gratitude, acceptance, non-judgment, and deep connections. Those are the 10 or 12 tips. And and there's nothing wrong with any of those things, by the way. I practice a lot of the, like, practicing gratitude is good. It's better than not being grateful, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with those things. They're good. They're helpful. But what do any of those things do about the reality of the brother who just committed suicide or the son who overdosed on his meds or the marriage that's been decimated by betrayal and infidelity? What do those things do about the reality of the young married couple whose husband was lost to alcohol addiction? Now, these aren't, those things that I just listed are not hypotheticals. Those are things, four things that I've dealt with in people for the last two weeks. One of my friend's son, uh, brothers, one of my friend's brothers committed suicide. Another one of my friends, the pastor that married me and Candace, his son overdosed on his meds. P- dealing with people whose marriages are in shambles and a married couple that, that, you know, she newly wed didn't realize that her husband had an addiction with alcohol and he died. These are not hypothetical. These are real things that are happening in our lives and in our families and in our communities. And as I list these things, they're probably not too far from home for you. Like, whether that's in your home or somebody you know, you know that someone's experiencing suffering. Again, many of the practices suggested mindfulness, gratitude, all those things are not bad. They're helpful. But do they actually bring the peace that your soul longs for in this fallen world? The answer we know is no, it doesn't. The world has fallen, the world is sick, our souls are sick, and, and there's only one healer. Our heart, hearts are heavy burden, and we need the great physician to bring true and lasting healing that only he could bring. Any attempt to overcome all of these things, all of these sufferings, um, apart from Christ is, is vanity. It's a chasing after the wind. It's restless. It's unsatisfying. You're going to always be pursuing it. And this is why people lose, uh, lose hope and they fall into despair and they commit suicide. Why? Because they're, they've tried everything this world has to offer without finding the remedy that their soul is longing for. It's tiring. It's an exercise in futility. It's spinning on a wheel and getting nowhere. Ecclesiastes 1 Two says, absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility, everything is futile. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun, and I found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. Um, the prophet Haggai, he, he prophesies about this and, and why the human heart is continuing to be restless. He says in, in Haggai um, 1.6, you've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat but you never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but you never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but you never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts wages into a bag with a hole in it. It's this pursuit of happiness and fulfillment and completion that we cannot find apart from God. We were not meant to find wholeness or happiness or completion or peace apart from God. Jeremiah 2.13, he says, my people have committed two sins. You think about all the sins that Israel committed, and he says, it's really just two. What were they? They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug for themselves cisterns, cracked cisterns that don't hold water. If you think of all the sins of Israel, he said, it really boils down to two, that you've abandoned your source of life, refreshing peace and sustenance. You've abandoned me, and you tried to seek that stuff, in other things, 
in these cisterns. You're trying to dig up for yourself cisterns when there's everlasting, never-ending water in Christ. He says you try to dig up for yourself a cistern and they don't hold any water. And, and it does us no good if we try to put a Christian spin on the superficial peace that the world offers. And the church is, is notorious for this, right? God just wants you happy. No worries. Everything's going to be all right. No, Jesus says right here that you will have suffering. I've told you these things in verse 33 so that in me you may have peace. In me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I've conquered the world. So as we're continuing in our uh, uh, wrapping up of the Upper Room Discourse, we're we're answering the question, why do I need the Holy Spirit? Why do I need the Holy Spirit? Because a a, a big bulk of the Upper Room Discourse, John um, 13 through 16, um, is Jesus promising the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to and through us. And last week, we talked about we need the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he gives us a knowledge that transcends human understanding. And tonight we're exploring the second reason, which is he gives us a, a peace that surpasses understanding. A peace that surpasses understanding. So it, it's, it's going to be heavy, but don't worry. It's going to be better. It'll get better. Don't worry. You guys could be all right. In order for us to understand the source of peace that God gives us, we have to understand the, the source of our grief and mourning, right? Like, where is the suffering and grief coming from? If we're going to grieve, right, he promises us that we're going to grieve and we're going to mourn, right? So you got to kind of brace yourself for that. If he promises these things, then we want to make sure that we grieve and mourn properly, like we do it well, right? As Christ followers, we have to make sure that we're grieving and mourning over the right things. And this is your second point in the outline is we mourn differently than the world. We mourn differently than the world. Like we should not be mourning over the same things that the world mourns over and vice versa. He says in verse 20, truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn and the world will rejoice. So there's a way in which the world is actually happy about the things that you're mourning about. And so we have to stay true to the text. What is Jesus talking about here? There's things that are common to all of us, to whether you're a believer or a non-believer or uh, an adherent to a false religion, there's the same suffering that we all experience, right? The unjust death of the innocent or the the unjust treatment of the oppressed or, or poverty, inequality, all of the sorrows that mankind experiences, those are common to everybody, whether you're Christian or non Christian. Everybody grieves over those things the same way, unless you're some sort of like sadist. Right, to say this as someone who takes pleasure in the pain and suffering of other people, unless you're like that, that we, most people are grieved over these injustices, right? We all live in a world that's fallen as a result of sin. Sin and all of its consequences are, evidence, are, are evident to all of us. Everyone mourns over those things, but there is a way in which the Christian mourns differently than the world, right? Romans 8.22 says, all creation has been groaning together. Like, there, there's a way that everybody groans together, but there's a way that a Christian mourns differently than the world. So when I say that, this is not to say that unless you're a Christian, you are unsympathetic. That's not what I'm saying. I, I'm not saying that unless you're a Christian, you're heartless and callous to all of those other things. That's not what Jesus is saying. It, there, there's a lot of believers, or, or unbelievers, rather. There's a lot of unbelievers and false religions that are doing charitable work. Probably more charitable work than many of us. A lot of false religions and unbelievers are working to remedy the ailments of the afflictions of humanity. And and that's that's because we all are made in the image of God, right? Whether you're a Christian or non-Christian. So when Jesus says, truly, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice, he's making a clear distinction between the ways in which his followers are going to mourn and the world. And hint, it's not primarily about the plight of humanity. It's not about the plight of humanity. The disciples who he's talking to here, he's not saying you're going to weep and mourn because the economy of Jerusalem was going to crash and inflation would be high. This is, you know, there's a parallel here you'll pick up on. He's not saying that you're, the, the disciples are going to weep and mourn because the cost of child care and health care are too expensive to keep up with, and housing was high. There's not affordable housing. They're not going to weep and mourn because Jerusalem's position of power was going to be weakened in, the, in global politics or because immigration was a huge problem in Israel at that time. 
All of those things, by the way, and I'm talking, of course, American politics. These are the things that we're all weeping and mourning about. Those are all important issues, and, and there are gospel implications to all of these, and we should be concerned and take action. However, what he's talking about here is the followers of Christ are going to weep and mourn because of the betrayal and injustice done against God. He's not talking about the plight of humanity that's common to everyone. He says, you, disciples, are about to weep and mourn, not because of the injustice done towards mankind, but because of the injustice that's about to be done to me. And that's different. The injustice that's done against God, mankind rejoices over. But the injustice that's done against us, we all mourn those same ways. He says, no, as Christians, you are going to mourn differently than the world. It's easy to look at a human in anguish and grieve over them. Why? Because we're seeing them with our physical eyes. It's another thing to look upon that which causes God grief and to mourn over that. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. We can all look at a young woman who has been taken advantage of, a, a vulnerable girl in, distr in distress, and we can have pity on her, and that's right, and that's good. Like, she's made in the image of God, and that's the image of God in us, hurting for this young girl. But do we have that same disdain and wrenching of heart about the countless number of unborn image bearers who are aborted in their mother's womb every single year? It's easier for us to sympathize with the, with the young girl who's having the abortion than the fact that an image bearer of God has just been killed and murdered in the safest place that it should be in his mother's womb. Now, we can look at these human issues and care about them, but as followers of Christ, it's not primarily looking at them from a human-centered perspective. We're supposed to look at these things from a God-centered perspective, and when we do this, what happens is we mourn differently than the world. The world mourns differently than followers of Christ. We grieve over what God grieves over. I mean, I don't know if you've prayed that before. It's like, God, give me your heart. Break my heart for what breaks your heart. There's a lot of things that could break our heart, and many of them are good and right to, to have to brokenness over those things so that we could go, go to the Lord in prayer. But are we praying, Lord, break my heart for the things that break your heart? Genesis 6, 5 through 6 says, When the Lord saw human wickedness, was widespread on the earth and, in, and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made mankind on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Like, do we mourn the same way that God mourns? Psalm 106, 37 through 38 tells us that God mourns over the shedding of innocent blood and the killing of children. Psalm 78, 40 says that God grieves over humankind's rebellion and unbelief. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says that God is grieved over arrogance, lies, and the shedding of innocent blood. Ezekiel 6, 9 says that God is grieved over the promiscuous, idolatrous hearts of humanity. Luke 19, 41 through 44 says that God is grieved over humans ignoring or disregarding Christ ushering in the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus, he's looking over Jerusalem and he, and he says, that if you knew this day was coming, it would, that it would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. It says in verse 41 that as he approached and he saw the city, Jesus wept for it because of that. Followers of Christ are absolutely grieved over the injustices and sorrows of mankind. That's not, you know, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, that we're not supposed to grieve over those things. Absolutely we are. But we're infinitely more grieved and crushed over the injustices done against God by sinful, rebellious humans. He says in verse 20, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. Why were they going to mourn? Well, the, the disciples, they received Jesus as Lord. They, they received him as the Messiah. They knew that he was the long-awaited Messiah who was promised. They knew that he was the one that was going to establish the kingdom of righteousness and justice. They knew that he was the one to reverse the curse of mankind that was thrust upon humanity in Genesis 3. They knew that and, and rejoiced in Jesus in his physical presence, but he was about to be rejected by his own people. That's why they were going to be mourning. In the context, the world was rejoicing. Why? Because Jesus was a rabble-rousing troublemaker, right? Like he was bucking against the system. There was a way of the world, and Jesus was bucking up against the way of the world. And, and this is just a sentiment to John 3 where he says, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light. Because why? Their, their deeds were evil. 
For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. So our first point or second point is we mourn differently than the world. The world rejoices what the church mourns over. But the third point is where it gets better is that our sorrow will turn to joy. So we, we are promised sorrow, we're, we're promised grief and mourning, and, and we want to make sure that we're mourning the right way over the things that breaks God's heart. But once we do that, we don't, he doesn't want us to just stay there mourning and in grief. He says, no, 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 your, your sorrow is actually going to turn to joy. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. He doesn't tell them, by the way, and, and I love this, because a lot of times we want to, to not have people suffer and mourn, and we're like, no, no, don't do that. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't rebuke them for that. He doesn't say that they're their mourning is going to be wrong or inappropriate or misguided or misinformed. He, he, doesn't, he says that their mourning actually would be justified just as much as a woman's la- pain and labor would be justified. He tells them that their mourning would not be wrong, but that their mourning would just be temporary. So that's the good news. He's like, it, you, yes, you will mourn, you will have suffering, you will have grief, you will have sorrow, but the good news, it's only temporary. And not only is it temporary, the intensity in which you would be mourning and grieving would actually be overshadowed by the intensity of your joy as a result of it in the same way that a woman, her pain is intense during labor, but that intense pain is overshadowed by the joy that she has in holding her child. He says when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come, but when she's given birth, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now. But I will see you again. When will he see them again? When he sends the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth who will guide them into all truth. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. I love that. No one will take your joy from you. So in, in, the, in the face of unfathomable loss... Right? They, they have the person of Jesus physically with them. In the face of that loss, they will have unshakable joy that can't be taken away from them. Unfathomable loss, unshakable joy, that's the life of the Christian. This is an encouragement to you. John 16, 33 says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous, I've conquered the world. If you're suffering grief or sorrow Jesus says you could take heart, and that word take heart just means be courageous. Be courageous. Christ has overcome the world. So the question then comes, how are they able to experience this level of joy in the midst of that kind of suffering and pain and loss? Point four is the Holy Spirit brings us peace that surpasses understanding. This is why we need the Spirit of God. He says, yes, I'm I'm leaving. You're going to experience suffering and loss, but... It's not going to be permanent. It's going to be temporary. I'm coming to you again in the person of the Holy Spirit. You will have suffering, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. This is, and and by the way, this is not a courage that you could just like muster up on your own. When Jesus says, be courageous, he's not saying like try harder, that you can't do this on your own. Christ promises that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. It's a work that he does in your heart. That's good news for me because, I mean, I try and try and try, but it's a chasing after the wind. I can't do it. Literally just today in my time with the Lord, journaling and praying, I I pray and journal at the same time. Uh, It's one of the ways in which I pray. I, I had to confess my weakness, my inability, and my dependency upon the Lord. I had to do that. Why? Because a lot of times I try and try and try to do things in my power, in my strength, and it just... It feels exhausting. And so when he tells us to be courageous, he's not saying just try, try, try. Do this in your own power. He's saying you can't do this. You can't muster this up on your own. The spirit of truth is coming, and he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit ministers to us peace, rest, satisfaction, knowing that Christ has overcome all the sufferings that this world contains, and in him we are overcomers. And so so when I say that the Holy Spirit brings us uh, a peace that surpasses your understanding. That means like my understanding is limited. My understanding will just say stops right here. I need peace that goes beyond that because I get to the end of my understanding and I still don't have peace. Why? Because I need the Holy Spirit to give me the peace that surpasses my understanding. 
The world grieves differently than us. They can't relate to what we grieve over. And likewise, our, our grief turning to joy, the world doesn't know what we're all happy and excited about. Like, why are you joyful? Like, when we look at the state of our country and our nation, and when we look at the state of our own city, and we see the brokenness, and we see how confused people are, how, what, what are we so joyful about? In Christ, we can experience unfathomable loss and joy in grief in the midst of unshakable joy. And that's not just a, a in the future thing. That's now and forever. Like now, we can experience this joy. How? Hope. We have hope. We're looking towards something, faith, and the longing for the kingdom. Uh, experiencing God's presence with us. Like this time of worship we just had right now, we experience joy and peace. The healing power of Christ in us to see the kingdom advance through us. Like we experience that joy now, but also he promises that you're going to experience that forever in the ultimate state of glory where all the redeemed of the Lord live in inexpressible joy in his near presence. I, I love this promise in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He says, this is the apostle Paul, he says, For now we see as only as a reflection in, in a mirror. It's like right now, we're seeing this hope, we're seeing this joy, but it's, it's really dim. Like they didn't have mirrors the way we have mirrors today, right? It's like bronze, and, and, and you could see through it, and you see the picture there, and, and so you see it. But he says right now, it's only dimly like a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Right now, I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Like, that's the hope and the peace that we could find today and forever. Like, today I have hope, I have faith, I have peace. I can experience the presence of the Holy Spirit with me today, right now. However, my hope and my joy is rooted in something that's deeper than just in the here and now. It's in the eternal. Like, right now we just see it face to face, but I, I'm believing by faith that I'm going to see him face to face in his near presence. This is the joy that we hold to that anchors us in a way that the world can't relate to. So, so like you could download the mindfulness meditation apps. You could do the practice of gratitude and the positive affirmation and trying to visualize your happy place. I'm not saying don't do any of those things, but ultimately the thing that's going to anchor your peace and your joy is the joy that you have in Christ. See, when you, when you put your, let's just say you put your joy and your hope in, in, in your circumstances. When I get X thing or when this this trial is over, or when I uh, am past this addiction, or when I have this relationship restored, my, my circumstances are going to change, then I will have peace. That means that everything might be going well, and you might have peace in that moment, but what happens when you feel the rug pulled out from under your feet and all of those things go away? You lose your joy, you lose your peace. We have to have our peace rooted in something and anchored in something that's deeper and more lasting and more eternal, more unshakable, and that's the hope that we have in the gospel. He says that you will have suffering, you will experience sorrow, but your sorrow will turn to joy, and that joy, nobody's ever going to be able to take that away from you. It doesn't matter what circumstances you go through. It's unshakable. So like the disciples, we can experience unfathomable grief and loss and unshakable joy at the same time. Why? Because our joy is rooted in something that's heavier, deeper, weightier than any of the burdens that this world can throw our way. And so th this message, I know it started heavy, and, and I hope that you feel encouraged in this because, again, th this doesn't escape any of us. Like, none of us are immune to the, the sorrows and the grief that this world has. Like, I know some of your stories, and, and the people that I don't know, I'm sure you're going through something or have gone through something or will be going through something. Right, the, the, the word of God, Jesus' own words, red letter, he promises that you will have sorrow, you will have grief. It, it, it's gonna touch every one of us, whether it's us personally in our own homes or, or in the people that we love and we care for. But in the midst of all of that, we have an answer that the world cannot give us. We have the hope of the gospel and that, that should minister to us. When I talk about at Ecclesia, we want to be a gospel fluent people. That means that as we're talking to people, the gospel pours out of us. Right? So if we're talking to somebody and they're experiencing suffering or sorrow or grief, we have a gospel answer that could come out of us. Why? 
because that he's called us to make disciples. He's called us to proclaim the gospel. In the gospel is the power of God and his salvation. We ourselves who have experienced the, 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 the comfort of the Holy Spirit, we give those who are experiencing suffering and sorrow the comfort that we have received. And so I want us to, to uh, we're going to uh, cut this message a little bit short, uh, especially in light of the, the events that happened yesterday. Um, I don't know if you heard of this little thing that they tried to assassinate the uh, former President Trump, who's, who's the, everybody knows what's happening. We saw it all over social media. Um, when I see that, you know, people are expected to have like a response and, and like a deep opinion about these things. Um, I, I wasn't surprised at all. I wasn't, I don't know if you guys were surprised, like shocked. Nobody I know has um, said, oh yeah, that was a good thing. Everybody's condemning it. So is that what we do? Is we just like look at this thing and we just, okay, I condemn it. Nobody should try to kill somebody. I've done my part. No, like when I see this, not, not only was I not surprised, um, but for me it was an indication of the state that we're in as a country. I wouldn't have been surprised if it happened on the other side, if Biden was at a rally and someone tried to do it to him. It wasn't a left versus right. This is a, a symptom of a nation that is far from God. We have a sickness. That, that murderous heart, that murderous spirit that is so upset with whatever, I don't know who the person was or what their motivation was or if they're mentally insane. I, none of that matters. What matters, what, what I'm seeing in that is that is a symptom of what's in the hearts of our country. We need to pray. We need to pray. Like, as a church, we're supposed to be the light of this world. We're supposed to be the, conscious, uh, the conscience of society. And a lot of times, it, it, what really grieves my heart is the church just acquiescing to the culture. And we say the same talking points as the culture. Someone shares something on social media, whatever the political, whatever political side you're on, they just retweet or reshare Whatever the world is saying, we're supposed to have a different answer. We look at that and we say, this is a symptom of a sick nation that needs Christ. And as a church, what do we need to do? We don't fight with the weapons of this world. The weapons that we fight with are spiritual, not carnal. We need to be praying. He says that if the nation would turn to me, seek my face, turn to me and pray, then I would see and hear from heaven and, and heal their land. We need healing in our land. We need to pray. And so... Um, I wanted to, to have this message be short for a couple of reasons. One is we need to pray about that, about our, uh, just the state of the nation and what our response is. And, and I don't have this deep, like, okay, this is what we need to do, rally the truth. I, like, I don't know. I just know, like, Lord, we need to pray. We need to pray. But on top of that, not only is that a symptom of, of where we are as a nation, like the church, there's, there's suffering and there's grief here in our own four walls. And I want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to be prayed for. And not just by me. The word says that we need to pray for one another. And so I don't know if anybody here came in downcast or sorrowful or whatever is going on in your life. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to stand as Candace leads us through uh, this song. We're going to stand and we're going to turn in groups. And it might be awkward if you've never done this, um, but it's okay. You'll, you'll live through it. It'll be awesome at the end. Uh, we're going to stand in groups, and if anybody, if, if there's anybody, as I've been preaching, and you know, like, this is the thing that's been heavy on my heart. This is the sorrow that I've been experiencing. If you have the courage to just say, I need prayer for, and you don't have to go into specific detail about every aspect of it, but if, if you just make it known that I just need prayer for whatever it is you might be going through, and if someone can just, in that group, take leadership of, of praying on behalf of that group, I want us to pray for the sorrows, for the grief that our body might be going through, but I also want us to pray for the church as a whole in the light of where we've been placed in this context in our nation at this time. Amen? Amen. So go ahead and stand with me. Go ahead and break up into groups. I'll join one of the groups that I see, and Candice will lead us in this song of worship as we pray.